Hello and welcome to Sick Notes. My name's Ed Hope. I'm a junior doctor from the UK and I asked you guys which medical TV show you'd like me to look at next. And it was a resounding vote for ER, the classic hospital drama from the 90s. Now, I never saw this first time around. I was only 12 years old when the first episode came out. I was probably too busy watching Jim Carrey film, so I'm not expecting the medicine to be sort of super accurate. It may be accurate for the time. I don't really know much about medicine back then. You know, with advancements in medical practice, things are probably different anyway. But as with all these TV shows, it's just a fun way for us to revisit the episodes, for me to explain maybe a little bit more about what's going on screen and to share some of my experiences. So let's crack on with the first episode of ER. Dr. Dean. Dr. Green. We tend to do a lot more work than sleep than is often depicted in these type of shows. But in some specialties, getting time to sleep is actually really accurate. So when I worked in obstetrics and gynecology, I'd frequently get a few hours every night, but never in the emergency department. What time is it? Five o'clock. <sighs> Can't the intern take it? It's Dr. Ross. So I've been in exactly this position, as I said, when I worked in Obstangani and, and I was covering labor ward. You'd often get bleak to do blood, so if there was an emergency cesarean section, and you'd wake up and you'd be in this sort of hot daze of confusion for a, a few seconds when you're trying to figure out where everything was. And as soon as it dawned on you what you were supposed to do, it was like, snap out of it and get on with the job. Dr. Ross. I'll be right there. <laughs> I've done exactly this stroll. This is basically what I'm like coming out of the on call room. We got some up on four stars. Come on, Doug. Mark you ball. Oh, did I wake you up? Yes, you did. Oh. <laughs> you are a real friend. I want you to know that. That's all right. Real friend. Yeah. We're now the bed to me. Yeah. Room three is free. Room three is free. <laughs> three is free. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> three is free. <laughs> So one of the actual doctors, I think, here has been brought in under the influence of alcohol. That's a nice way of saying completely p Treating other medical professionals definitely happens. The hospital is such a big place that it ends up servicing the people that also work there well. So I've been involved in a few cases of medical professionals. I know it's a really kind of dodgy ground. I mean, you try and get people to help that maybe don't know them so well, so that they, it's not a breach of confidentiality, but when you know, there's no other choice, it has to be you. So we need to be extra careful that information isn't spread to the whole medical team. <laughs> D5NS, I need the dextrose. So D5NS stands for dextrose and normal saline, which is a type of infusion fluid. The reason why we give people fluids when they're under the influence of alcohol is because to sort of counter the diuretic effect of alcohol, so it makes you pee out lots of your fluids, we try and replace that. And the reason why we give dextrose a type of sugar is when your blood sugar goes low, it's the liver's job to bring that blood sugar up by releasing glucose from its stores. Now, if the liver is too busy breaking down alcohol, then it is unable to do this effectively. So your blood sugar goes down, so therefore we replace it with an IV line. Give him 600 of ASA. Aspirin. I almost forgot aspirin. 600 milligrams aspirin. We give high dose aspirin for pain relief in things like migraines, but I wouldn't give it in someone with alcohol issues. The reason being is that people who have alcohol excess are more likely to get stomach ulcers that aspirin can make significantly worse. So it's nice to see other healthcare professionals around the bed. In reality, they'd usually do a lot more than they're seen to be doing. The doctor would literally just be taking the history, examining and prescribing the medication. So all the cannulas and drugs and would be done by the nurse. But clearly in this, Dr. Green has taken a sort of role because it's one of his friends and one of his colleagues that has come into the department. Dr. Green. Dr. Green. Mark. What is it? Can I give Mrs. Williston more Demerol? She's complaining of pain. 
50 milligrams, I am. Thanks, Mark. The verbal orders are definitely something that exists, but normally when you're too busy to see something that's not as high priority rather than just when you're asleep. I had to Google what Demerol was because I'd never heard of it. It's actually pethidine, which is an unusual choice for pain relief, but obviously this might be because it's back in the 90s. Although we still use it for pain relief in labor. And you'll find that a lot of medications used in pregnancy are kind of the older medications. And that's because a lot of the newer and arguably better medications we don't have evidence for because we don't run trials in pregnant ladies just because we don't want to run the risk that they might cause birth defects. So therefore in pregnancy, we go where we have evidence and the evidence it tends to be with older medications. Morning, Dr. Ben. Hey, Jerry. Morning, Doctor. This was the scene at... Oh, I do like coming into the emergency department and saying sort of hello to everyone as you go in. It does, it gives you a nice little buzz actually to have so many different people from all kind of walks of life and all kind of different parts of their career. It is one of the best things about being a doctor, not only serving kind of a broad spectrum of society, but also working with a broad spectrum as well. In room four needs a CBC. The man in five is a rule out MI, waiting for cardiac enzymes in another 12 days. Dr. Ross, he's in three, sleeping it off. This updating of all the patients in the emergency department, this happens a lot. We do this a few times a day. So just to make sure we're not missing anything, so we'd have a board round where we all meet together and discuss every single case that's currently in the department. That's soon. Do you know what this is all about? Building collapsed in a loop. They're sending us a dozen hot ones. Yeah, well, who's on? Just us. Okay, forget all that. Call Susan Lewis, call the 7th and 8th floor, tell them we need anybody they can spare. The way that was shot and taking that pre-alert call, it, it made me tingle. I can totally relate to that feeling. I've never worked in a major trauma center, but having that pre-alert through and you're the one in recess and you just, your mind is racing of what, you know, what's happened and what condition the patient's gonna be in and you're having to brief the team and get everything ready. I mean, it certainly, you know, the way the music speeds up here and the pace of the, the scene seems to change, you know, that is exactly what happens in real life. Cutting clothes off, very realistic. I've had loads of people get upset about cutting their trousers off. I had a guy in a sort of fancy dress outfit who was not happy at all. <laughs> Presumably he was gonna lose his deposit, but you know, it had a significant injury. So, you know, I, I don't give a monkeys about his <laughs> deposit. That can all be sorted out later. But when you're trying to look after people, you need a bit of tough love. We got a pre op here. Notify the OR, get us a room, okay. call vascular, and call orthopedic. Tell them to come down here now. It's their lucky day. In reality, you do a more general assessment of the patient. We call this an A to E assessment because you don't want to get too distracted by a hand injury unless there's a lot of blood there. But I like the fact that they alert lots of other teams early. I mean, often in these TV shows, you see the doctor doing everything themselves. But this is a lot more realistic. I mean, this ED doctor is only going to real stabilize the patient. It's going to need a vascular surgeon to make sure we restore the blood supply to the hand, an orthopedic surgeon to make sure we preserve the function of the hand, and maybe even a plastic surgeon as well if we're looking at some of the tissues. Oh, we're going to save your hand. Don't worry about a thing, okay? Clear. That shot of the guy randomly getting defibrillated, it seems a bit off really. Uh, when we yell clear, it's because we want everyone to be clear of the bed, just so the people don't get an electric shock as well when we get more casualties. Uh, so, it, and also you'd have kind of more people around if you're having a cardiac arrest. I appreciate it's supposed to be an emergency, so not many people there, but this just didn't really look like a realistic arrest really. Does it hurt when you breathe in? <laughs> have you been coughing up any blood? Okay, let me take a listen. <laughs> this is a bad job from Dr. Green here. He's not getting distracted by the obvious injury. He's talking to the patient, so he knows the patient's airway is okay. And then he's moving on to B, so he's listening to the chest to work out the breathing. Good work, matey. It goes without saying, Dr. Ross shouldn't be working right now. Even in an emergency like that, it's more irresponsible to have someone that's been under the influence of alcohol there. Um, although he doesn't look hungover at all. Okay, all right, I want you to tell me if it hurts you when you breathe. No, 
I don't get a BP. So this lady has an upper GI bleed, so she's vomiting blood. I'm pretty sure she's not part of the trauma call because this isn't usually a presentation of trauma. I've seen a few of these in reality. They are super scary because it's not like you've got a bleed, an obvious bleed that you can compress and stop it happening. It's happening from the inside. So as uh, Dr. Ross does here, we get two IV access points so we can give in lots of blood. We and replace the clotting factors as well. We don't tend to give fluids because that can dilute the clotting factors and dilute the blood products. So unless that blood pressure is dropping, we tend to just go a little bit easy on the fluids. We basically get more prepped so they can go and have a scope, so a camera down to try and sort out the bleed. So, uh, you think you can save the hand? Looks pretty good, I think so. Good, I told him you could, so he's counting on you. Peter, you're a smart ass. Never promise a patient something like that. I mean, you can try and be positive in an emergency situation, but don't promise something like that there. You know, that can really stick with people and it can make it difficult for them to get over their injuries. They'll often target that as, you know, a failure in the care. So communication issues tend to be one of the biggest problems in medicine. My beautiful doc. Thank you. You're married? No, I'm a doctor. Well, then listen. Take it easy, Mr. Barr. You wouldn't want to fall on your face twice in one day. <laughs> I hear plenty of stories of patients like this. Pretty accurate. So our lady with the upper GI bleed, the one that was vomiting blood, has a cardiac arrest. Now, usually in these medical shows, the cardiac arrest rhythm is a systole, but in this one, it's ventricular fibrillation, which is brilliant because that can respond to a defibrillator. So the doctor running the code here really shouldn't be doing the chest compressions and there's no need to keep looking up at the monitor. The monitor won't tell you anything because when you're doing the compressions, that interrupts the reading of the electrical activity so you can't tell anything for it. So we normally do the CPR in cycles, so you should just be doing two minutes and then you should stop the CPR briefly just to check the rhythm. That's the only time you should stop CPR to do a rhythm check and then get straight back onto the chest compressions. So the patient has responded to a defibrillator. I'm glad she didn't just sit straight up and take a cup of tea. <laughs> Whenever you have downtime like that from a successful cardiac arrest, you know, just having blood supply denied to some of your organs for a short time will mean your body needs a lot of time to recover. So people will end up going to intensive care unit for sort of monitoring and maybe even some support systems as well. Clearly in this patient, the bleeding is still going on. So they'll need to go to theater to have the scope, the camera test I talked about to stop the bleeding, which caused the cardiac arrest. Relaxing in the doctor's mess or the doctor's office or the common room. In some specialties, this happens a lot more than in others. In the emergency setting, it tends to just be when we have designated breaks that we get time off rather than there's never really a time where it's quiet enough to come away and just have these moments away. Oh, damn it. The nurses have been in here raiding the coffee again. Why don't they just make their own? I'm going to tell them about this. Never mind. Coffee Wars. <laughs> They've definitely done their research on this one. There's always some kind of argument over the tea and biscuits and coffee and all that type of thing in the common rooms. That's the first tailored white coat I've ever seen. Who is it? Think he knows anything? He knows that address. Medical students in the emergency department, I love the fact they've taken time to show this. So in my role as well, I basically look after the medical students at the hospital. So it's really cool just they've given some time to show how they are. And I always try and do this kind of walk through when they shadow me for the first time in the department um, as is going on here. Mark everything stat whether you want it fast or not. Everybody gets an IV the minute they walk through the door. Use an angiocath with a 16 needle. You need a large <laughs> one. Case. And this is like really accurate in the emergency setting. Although we feel like we give tailored care to everyone that comes in, there's lots of common things that we do with everyone that comes in the emergency department. And although your med medical textbooks don't really teach you that. It's only when you do the job do you realize kind of the common things that we everyone gets when they come into hospital. You have the medical examining rooms. This is where the pill pushers kill their victims. But this, this is the surgical room. This is where the real action is. It's a pretty amazing specialty that someone comes in with something, you fix it and they're kind of better. That's a pretty cool thing to do isn't it whereas in medicine can be a little bit more hit and miss a little bit more investigating a little bit more trying stuff out so that's why 
the sort of surgeons disparagingly call the medical team the pill pushers. So I've met loads of residents like Dr. Benton in the emergency department and I just love working with them. As I said in my videos before, you kind of need every type of personality within medicine because we treat every type of people and we need people to fill the different roles. But working with people like is shown here, Dr. Benton, who are kind of a little bit of a maverick but really know their stuff, it's great to work with them because, you know, they keep you on your toes and they're always, when you need them, they're kind of always there for you. <laughs> this medical student, Carter, with his clipboard. <laughs> it does, it reminds me of some of the characters I've seen. I was never a clipboard medical student. Here, you finish. Okay, this isn't gonna hurt at all. Oh, the reason why I would see is that this is super realistic. I mean, when you do any kind of invasive procedure for the first time or, you know, the first few times, you get super self-conscious about it. You know, when I was first suturing, I was lucky I had direct supervision from a consultant, which you should have. And I had a chap that had fallen through some glass and I was just cleaning it up and suturing it up. And, you know, I was so nervous. My hand was sort of tremoring like this. I remember the consultant really patient guiding me through and the patient as well was amazing. He was basically just like, the consultant was telling me technically what to do and the patient was basically uh, giving me motivation, just saying, you can do it, go on mate. And yeah, it was, so although I was as self-conscious shown here, I was had a much luckier opportunity, I think. Tell you I want to belt her right in the mouth, I really did. Uh -huh. Then I go and shoot myself in the leg. Well, these things happen. I bet you see a lot of stuff working in a place like this. Yeah. Oh yeah, all, all the time. Yeah, whenever I see something strange, I always say to the patient that we've seen it all before. You know, even if it's, you know, we haven't seen that particular thing before, you've got to expect the unexpected. And so much part of when people come out in like this is the kind of embarrassment and sometimes you know, the humiliation of what's going on. So we need to reassure them just to make sure they're really comfortable with what's going on. Oh, cool. So a maternity case in the emergency room. This is pretty extreme. Someone literally about to give birth. Anesthesia, call the pediatrician, hook up those stirrups. You doing an episiotomy? It's pretty impressive that Dr. Green knows what to do. I mean, that's not necessarily unrealistic because you don't really know what path people have gone through medicine. Someone's suggesting an episiotomy, so that's when we cut the perineum with the babies having difficulty coming through the birth canal. That's a bit random, isn't it? Because the doctor hasn't examined them yet. And also, you'd probably want a kind of specialist to do that. Again, I don't know Dr. Green's background, so he may be capable of doing that. Um, but usually that is only when we're struggling. I love the way they have lots of other medical professionals there helping out and it's always kind of busy and doesn't look totally perfect. You know, this is the reality of medicine. I mean, in this scenario though, the absolute person you'd want is a midwife. They are like the powerhouses of labor and some of the most dedicated, just awesome people I've worked with are the midwives. And I think the reason is that they get this rush every day of seeing a baby delivered. Like how amazing is that? The most brilliant kind of motivation, right? So you'd expect a few more bodily fluids flying around, but all in all, that was pretty realistic. You know, babies can happen that quickly. And as I say, that awesome rush you get when a baby's delivered, you feel just, an amazing connection with nature really. Sounds a bit cheesy, but that's always kind of how I felt when a baby would come up, particularly during a cesarean section when uh, the obstetrician would then lift the baby up above the screen so the mum and dad can see them for the first time. And it was always, you know, sort of like a seed from the Lion King really. Yeah, so it's an unscheduled delivery like this. So you definitely have a pediatrician ready to greet the baby. So that's a nice little touch in the soft tissue superficial to the mid shaft of the fibula. A bullet, a bullet is what it's called, Steve. Goes without saying that we use computers now without light boxes, but you guys obviously knew that already. This kind of weird technical language is still pretty important because often people don't have access to images. So if you're calling someone to discuss a case or you're speaking to someone, you know, just in person, we need to have a common scientific language to describe things precisely. So although it's kind of sent up here, it does have a use. And when you're first learning all these terms, it can feel like your mind boggles, but before you know it, you, you kind of quite au fait with everything. 
Morton? M O R. What do you mean? We sent this to you an hour ago. Don't give me that. It is 1.40 and it was a stat determination. What are you guys doing down there? Picking your nose? Delays in investigations. Oh my god. Super common. The worst is where you, someone comes into the emergency department, has been waiting a while, you take blood from them, they then wait for the blood results, and then you find out that the blood sample's kind of been lost somewhere. So then you have to bleed the patient again, so you have to have another needle, and then you have to again wait a couple of hours for the blood results. That's the most frustrating thing. So someone's definitely done their homework in this regard. Also, I've had it once before where the whole lab at my hospital went down, so all the blood samples needed to be sent to a different hospital. How mad is that? I mean, if that was in like a medical TV drama, I would be saying how unrealistic that is because it'd be some kind of contingency. Well, our contingency was to send it to another hospital. So, you know, that was a really kind of busy and day that we had to kind of adapt a lot to what was going on. I'm gonna go to lunch. Actually, I'm all right if there's something else that you want me to do. Excuse me. Don't be a hero. If I tell you to go to lunch, you go. It's a long time before dinner and we may be too busy then to stop it. Oh, this, this takes me back. I had exactly this conversation with my first ever consultant and he just said, you know, in medicine, you're going to be worked like a dog, basically. So when you have those breaks and those times where you can get your breath back, then you should take them. So any medical students watching, why would you get a red cross on your exam paper for examining a patient like this? Any ideas? <laughs> yeah, so we normally examine patients from their right hand side. Um, clearly in practice, it's not always possible, but that's what we're supposed to do. Paperwork. <laughs> and you can often feel quite frustrated about writing this paperwork because there's people who need your attention, right? Who are, who are waiting to be seen. And you, when you're doing the paperwork, it can seem like the least important thing to do, but it needs to be done promptly. Sometimes you can store up a few cases and write them, but it's always best to write things kind of as you, as you go or as soon as you've seen a patient. You do get better at it. I tend to kind of write less, but end up saying more because you kind of know the things that are really important, you know, both positives and important negatives. But even so, yeah, it is a bit of a slog nowadays. I understand, but what do you think in the meantime? Just I think in the meantime, you should consider it a potentially serious finding. So you're saying I got cancer? I'm not saying that. Is it so hard? Are you afraid to tell me the truth? Your history of coughing blood weight loss and this x-ray is suggestive of cancer but the diagnosis has not been confirmed and it may very well be something else and none of us should jump to any conclusions until we know this scene was absolutely brilliantly done you kind of see this a few times in the emergency department every month or so when you pick up something often like incidental so something you didn't expect to pick up or something you picked up that's not necessarily an emergency, so nothing we need to do today, but something that is going to be life-changing, like a cancer. And the doctor does exactly the right thing here. You know, we don't know it's cancer in the emergency department, we just have a high suggestion. And so there is, we shouldn't be giving that kind of news to the patient. We're not set up as um, a kind of place to be able to deliver that and follow that up. It needs to be dealt with in the right way. Um, she doesn't dodge the question, you know, she answers the patient's questions very clearly and she tells them what we know, what we don't know and the plan we're going to have to figure it all out. So I thought this was a really nice moment actually, felt very, very genuine, very realistic. Are you serious? It could be a matter of life and death and I'm not exaggerating. I'm not pregnant. And she's got a pain in the lower left quadrant, she's not pregnant? Mm -hmm. Can you tell me how long has it been since you've had your last period? I don't know. Well, just think back. Tell me roughly. It was after Christmas. Okay. And you've had sexual intercourse? <laughs> I love this is brilliant. Okay, for two reasons. Working in A&E, people denying that they can be pregnant happens all the time. And secondly, when you take a history of a patient and they categorically say this happened and then you know you report that to your consultant and then your consultant comes and takes the history with you and the patient sort of says something totally different and just you know makes you look like a complete idiot uh i think 
consultants kind of know that you often don't necessarily ask the question in the best way. So Dr. Benton asked when she had her last period. So that's the skill, isn't it? Finding a different line of questioning to, you know, find out exactly what's going on. All right, move around three, one, two, three. Come on, people, let's get her clothes off. Let's go, let's go. So the drug overdose that comes in is one of the nurses that works on the unit that went home earlier. This, so again, you know, they're treating people, medical professionals that they work with. You see so many overdoses in A&E and it is super sad because although you're dealing with that acute problem, you're not doing the hardest bit, which is actually managing it long term. Obviously, the acute problem can sometimes cause life changing issues it can kill you the common misconception is that we have the kind of reversal agents for a lot of drugs when we don't really we kind of monitor patients and support any kind of abnormal things that are going on and just wait for the body to kind of break down the drug itself so for example some drugs will suppress your breathing so we may need to ventilate the patient some drugs may interrupt the electrical activity of the heart so we make sure we monitor the heart and stabilize it with medications if need be I can't give this up. No, 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 not you. You're, you're fine. You're Dr. Fine. Green, your wife on 2204. Yeah, I have to call her back. Oh, man, I like Dr. Green. He's, he's a cool guy, isn't he? I totally appreciate that sentiment. Cool. It's, oh, it's a clever little ending tying it all together. And when you do night shifts, you do end up kind of losing track of what day it is because you end up going into work the same day that you left work, which is really surreal. So this kind of, you know, being disorientated like this definitely fits. So that's the end of the episode. I, that was absolutely amazing. It blew me away. Absolutely loved it. I mean, the set was incredible with, it just looked so real. I mean, it looked like a documentary. The way it was filmed made you feel part of it. It wasn't all these crazy artistic camera angles. The kind of, the set as well, the way it looked messy and kind of disorganized, that is very much what hospitals are kind of still like. And the characters as well, they, I, I could see in them people that I knew. Like the fact they had lots of medical professionals there. And the patients, we saw lots of different patients bringing in problems, you know, that were made worse by their kind of personal issues. We had serious problems, we had things that weren't serious. We had lots of standard issue problems as well, not crazy diagnosis. I, I absolutely loved it. Absolutely brilliant. I mean, I saw so much in what, you know, what I see day to day. So definitely going to watch another episode of it, despite it being so old which is kind of like a testament to what's going on. So thank you to everyone that suggested I take a look at this. I'm still running the poll down below so you can still vote on other shows you want me to take a look at. As always, thank you so much for the support that you're giving me on this channel. I mean, the subscribers and the views and everything, the comments are just awesome. Thank you so much. I'll just keep making videos as long as you keep watching them. So, uh, well, until next time then, goodbye.